Good morning, everybody. So I guess we are now ready to go here in this room. So I, I want to welcome you to this uh, joint uh, effort from, from the Development Commission, ISU Development Commission, ISU Medical Commission for the first ever Healthy Skater uh, mini seminar. Hopefully this is going to be a an, an series and that's, that's kind of our, our wish that we do this annually with a little bit different topics. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, also uh, welcome all the people around the world through streaming uh, in, this, uh, in this seminar. We are first time also streaming these events around the world and capturing then all these materials on the ISU YouTube channel, so it's there to be seen afterwards. So if you let the people know that it's, it's, it's there, so, so more and more people are getting into these um, important matters and, and, and getting to, to be developed and, and uh, get new ideas. Well, I would like to use the opportunity to a little bit of uh, telling you about the, the way we are going with the Development Commission. We are fairly new commission with the three people, and here's uh, uh, with me is uh, uh, Tatsuro Matsumura uh, here, and and also uh, uh, not here, but uh, the third member of our commission is Ildo Gemser, who's from the speed skating. So our mission is is to improve the skaters uh, and officials, coaches around the world in, the, in uh, competitive sports and also to widen the sports further. So this is also one of the very important topics what we are having here is how the skaters stay healthy, how they can prevent injuries, how these huge technical skills what they are performing how they can do it healthy. And I'm really happy to hand to chain this, the floor to you to let us know how that is possible. Thanks very much, Suzanne. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with the Development Commission and bringing some education on uh, the medical uh, issues for our skaters because uh, they do train very hard, they have to train hard, and it's our job to make sure that they do stay healthy and can continue to compete and achieve their dreams. So welcome to the First Coaches Seminar, and uh, welcome to all you online. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us, wherever you happen to be. I, uh, Susanna will be monitoring uh, the online session, so if you have questions uh, from the online session, we will see them and we can address them. The um, program for today is uh, listed there as you see it. I'm very fortunate to have some colleagues here today to present with me, and I will start the program talking about skating boots, and then Peter Zappolo from the U.S. Uh, Figure Skating Association will talk about the current physiological demands in figure skating. Then we'll have uh, David uh, Tornazzi from Italy speak about injuries in, injuries in figure skating. And then uh, Sven Ortheson from Germany to speak about preventing muscle injury. There may be some time for our presentations will be about 20 minutes in length. There may be some time after each presentation for a couple questions where we just switch the computers around. But if you have questions, they may be answered in the other presentations. So there will be time for a discussion at the end as well. So that's the, the way things have been set up for today. And um, I'm really pleased to see so many of you were able to take the time to attend after such a busy week. So thank you very much. So I'll start the day with my presentation on uh, figure skating boots and injuries. And these boots are our skater's equipment. And it's very, very important that we make the right choice for performance and prevention of injury with the boot. Our skaters begin to skate between the ages of four and five. And if they become competitive and elite, they will end up skating four to six hours a day, six days a week for 10 to 11 months of the year. So the skates we started with have developed, but not particularly in a good way, but they've developed to meet the physiological or the performance demands that are 
skaters' high technical performance now wants. And so the boot manufacturers have made them more and more restrictive to prevent, uh, to give them more support and prevent ankle injuries. But the stiffness of the modern figure skating boot has restrained the movement so much that it is starting to present injuries in our skaters with their forceful landings. So here's one of our world champions, Kurt Browning, and he has said, never underestimate the importance of the relationship between a skater and his skates. He had the first quad, which was in 1988, and then in 2002, Mickey Ando actually landed a quad, not quite fully rotated, but landed it in competition. But it's been that long before we now see quads with our skaters. Even our Olympic champion in 2010 didn't have a quad in his program. So there has been huge change. That would not happen today. So the progress over the last eight years has been quite significant. So in skating development, since 1988, the elimination of compulsory figures. And that's allowed the skaters to have more time to spend perfecting their jumps, throws, twists, spins, etc. In 2013, the judging, or 2003, excuse me, the judging system changed. And the scoring system was now based, rather than on a six-point score, it was based on the elements and the technical amount given for those elements, which then also gave marks for the footwork sequence in, be in between, the transition, and the amount of elements they could do in an allotted period of time. So the pressure on the figure skaters was to jump higher, increase the rotations, and cram more in to their elements between the jumps. And this increases the complexity of the program and their performance demands. So I'm just going to show you a, a video from 1998. And I just want you to watch the performance. And now I'm going to compare it to our world champion from 2017. And you will see that the progressive increase in check move performance has increased the demands from 1988. So the boot companies had to adapt to that by making a much stiffer boot, which would last longer for a status to compete in. So I think between those two programs, you can see there's a lot more packed into that period of time. The jumps are more difficult, there's more combinations. So if we just take a look at these two skaters and look at their boots and how Katarina's fit, how high they are, and how Yevgeny's fit. So we've built stability in all directions, and that's probably not the right way to go. In essence, we've built a cast around the foot, we've lowered the boot so that the movement can occur at the top of the boot rather than through the boot. The boot was supposed to offer support so that it stopped ankle sprains, but instead they're causing stress fractures, tendonitis, because of their restriction in the skater's foot and ankle. So the ISU conducted a study in 2003 where we measured the injuries in our elite figure skaters and nearly half of those 469 skaters had injuries from overuse. So we saw a significant increase in these injuries. So some of the facts about landing, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the technical aspects of the physiological part of this because Peter's gonna address that when I'm done. I'm gonna to try to focus just on a little bit of the information and then on the boots. So in each landing, there is, a, is counteracted by an uh, an equal and opposite force from the ice back up to the skater. And that's called the vertical ground reaction force. And that force has to be absorbed somewhere. 
It has to be absorbed in the boot or in the ankle, knee, hip, etc. So if we take away the absorption from the boot and we take away the movement at the ankle joint, none of that force is being dissipated until it hits the knee, the hip, or the back. But the force continues to go up until it dissipates. We know that when we put the skater in these boots that it lacks about 10 degrees of um, dorsiflexion, that's bringing the foot up, or plantar flexion, which is bringing the foot down. So you've decreased the range of motion in the ankle in these boots. So you've decreased the amount of absorption power in the ankle joint. We made the boot stiffer, so we decreased the amount of absorption if there was much in the boot to start with. So all that force then acts as a wave, which then has to go forward up into the knee, the hip, and the back. The other thing that they say about skaters is that we're the only athlete that jumps in high heels. So that also makes it more difficult to get a vertical jump or high jump. If your foot is actually, um, you can't get your plantar flexion, you can't push off as fast to get higher in the air. And that limits the amount of time you have to do your rotations so that when you come down, you're closer to the ice when you finish your rotation, which causes a, a significant momentum and force, vertical force when you hit the ice because you can't get up, because you can't plantar flex your foot. By lacking dorsiflexion, which is bringing your foot up, you lack the absorption once you hit the ice with that impact to absorb it in your foot by bringing the ankle up. So those are the reasons why our skaters are getting a few more injuries. Shoe design factors. We know from the multitude of studies that are being done in running shoes that the, the sole of the running shoe and the upper part of the running shoe are significant in preventing runners' injuries. There hasn't been as many studies done in figure skaters, but it's the same concept. We know that if a, running sh a runner runs 10K uh, a week and they do that on a regular basis, that they will wear out the running shoes in six months. The sole and the materials and the construction of the boot of the shoe is really important. They have a longitudinal arch to support and put the foot in a neutral position. There's a heel counter to, to support it so it doesn't slip and, and change the back of the heel. So the mechanics of the force going through the ankle joint are in line with the knee and the hip. We don't have that in the skate. We don't have the, the soft cushion in the sole. So we need to start applying some of these things too to our skates, if at all possible, and work with our manufacturers to do so. There is a nice study done by Andre Spiegel, who most of you probably know, was a Swedish champion for a few years, and he recently completed his master's degree. And in his master's degree, he did a study where he looked at the, he took two boat, boat, boots. He took the Idea Concerto, and he took the um, Groff Edmonton. And he looked at the properties of the boot. And what he looked at is he looked at um, the, the uh, material in these three spots of the boot. He looked at the lace of the boot and how many eyelets it had, three or four. He looked at the slant of the boot, the cut of the boot, whether it was straight or angulated. He looked at the sole of the boot and he looked to see what the thickness was, the height of the heel, the width across the forefoot, the depth of the heel, and the width across the heel. And he also looked at the materials used in the boot, and he looked at what he called the bendability of the boot. So the bendability of the boot he measured by having a skater in the boot standing facing a wall, and when they bent their knee and it hit the wall, at their maximum flexion, he measured the distance, sorry for the noise out there, he measured the distance between the wall and the tip of the boot. So if they didn't bend very far, the distance would be shorter, and if they could bend farther and their knee hit the wall, it would be farther away. That was his bendability factor. And when he looked at the material in the boot, he cut the Adia skate in half, and he looked at what the sole was made of, and the cross-sectional part showed that it was fiberglass, nylon plastic. There was a thin layer of a material that absorbed the vibrations, and the heel was curved and hollow. 
the upper part of the boot, the leather, it was an outside leather part. There was a plastic fiberglass, uh, microfiber part, and then a soft memory foam, and then the metal eyelets. When he looked at the um, Graf Edmonton, the outer sole was uh, leather, layered le leather, with a tapered profile. The heel was a uh, solid beach, and it had a um, shock-absorbing um, uh, rubber insole. And the upper part was uh, leather, uh, laminated fiber, microfiber, soft foam, and metal hooks. He then took his skaters, he, it was a small study, uh, he had six to eight skaters. I think he started with eight, but only six completed the study. And again, I'm not going to go into all the measurements, but just for this presentation, um, the skater, um, it was the same athlete, wore the two different kinds of boots. They wore the idea, ideas and they wore the graphs. And then they stepped off a platform that was 30 centimeters or 50 centimeters high. And in that study, he measured the impact force, he measured the time to maximum in impact, and he measured, the, he measured lots of things, but the things I want to present today were, are the joint measurements, how far the joint moved, the kinematics of the joints. And so you have the same skater, you have the same test, but you have different boots, and he measured the forces with that. And the results he came up with was that he finally put in print that there is a significant difference. He studied it, there's a significant difference in the boots in exposure of the body to the vertical ground reaction force in an angular position to the joints, to the flexion range of the ankle and the knee during impact, suggesting that the footwear is important in, that, in these aspects. And what he found is that the greater force was during landing in the Graf Edmonton boot. They didn't absorb the initial impact quite as well and significantly as well as the uh, Graf Hamilton did. However, the Graf Hamilton had greater dorsiflexion at the ankle and the knee. So the two things we want to make better in the boots, one did one and one did the other, but neither one did both of them. So again, they're sort of equal. The ISU did a study looking at the foot injuries. And we took the athletes at international competitions uh, from novice uh, above, and they were recruited to participate. And here we had um, 65 men and 95 women, and we had all disciplines except for synchro. We had singles, uh, pairs, and dance. And we wanted to know what injuries they were, they were, were occurring. So we took pictures of their feet, but we also, they also um, completed a survey. And, um, and we wanted to know what boots they were wearing and how long their boots lasted. So this is the boots that they're wearing. And you can see that most of them were, were in the, the, the top four there, the Raceport, the Groff, the Jackson, and the Adia. And these are the pictures of their feet. And we took the pictures of the feet when they're sitting, uh, just to see what the, and you've looked at skaters' feet. They're not the most prettiest feet in the world. And some of you may have feet that look like this. And we then put them in their skates, and we took a picture of them standing in their skates, which is the picture here. And then we took a picture of them bending in their skates. And you can see that this skater really does not have much uh, movement in the ankle at all. Normally, if you shouldn't have this gait on, you would have this much movement. So the flexibility in this boot is very little. And when we did a study, we, we decided that we would look at the fit versus the friction as a cause of injury, and the boot fit between a static fit and a dynamic fit. Because the boot may feel fine when they first put it on, but when they go to use it, and as it starts to break down, the dynamic fit isn't as good, and then they get injured. From the survey, we found out that 48% of them had experienced boot-related injuries, and that 27.7% of them had missed either training or competition because of their injury, anywhere from three days to six months. And the boot-related injuries I can show you in a, um, in a collage of photos here. 
this is just some of them. And you can see that this, in this skater here had a pad around their bone on the outside of their ankle, the malleolus, because it's a very common area they get bursitis. The, the pad has slipped in the shoe and has moved up here. They're getting a bit of a hammer toe like this one is from a fit. This is a friction injury. So the heel is sliding in the boot and they're probably gonna get Achilles tendonitis and they have a bump on their heel, a Haglund's hump. They get these from friction. This is a fit problem because there's a little ulcer between the two toes, it's too tight. So you can see that the feet get all sorts of injuries from tendonitis, bunions, bursitis, pressure sores, ulcers, uh, claw toes, etc. So we now have a problem of the feet being injured from the boot, trying to constrict it too much to hold it in a stiff boot, and the transmission of forces up the leg causing further injuries. This is another example of the, the fit problem. This is a lace bite from trying to do the skate up so tight that it's rubbing every time they try to move their ankle in their boot, it's rubbing and they're irritating their, their tendons and their skin underneath it. And this is a picture of what can happen, just one example of when those forces are transmitted up the leg. So this is a, a knee joint, this is the kneecap, this is the patellar tendon, and this little, where the arrow is, is a little piece of calcium. So as they jump and land with the significant forces, the forces are transmitted up the leg because they're not in, absorbed by the stiff boot. They can't be absorbed by the lack of range of motion in the ankle joint. And so the body then tries to make this tendon stronger. So it starts to put a little bit of bone in the tendon because it's been irritated with overuse from the uh, landing of the jump for so long. That doesn't work. So eventually, this little piece of bone gets pulled off. And this is really important in our junior skaters because this athlete isn't quite fully grown. This is, this is a, um, a young skater, their, apophys their epiphyseal plate, their growth plate isn't quite healed yet. And they pulled off this cartilage area from a growth plate. So this is what happens to our junior skaters when they overtrain and have too much force exerted and transmitted up their leg. And this is just one of them. So the boot-related injuries, with the survey, we found out that 26% of them were wearing orthotics in their skates, trying to do what the running shoe does for the runner and get that foot in a good alignment so the forces can at least be transmitted equally up through the joints. The lifespan of the boot was anywhere from two months to three years, so they might buy a boot that is more flexible, but because of their demands in the boot, it's wearing out quickly, but they might buy, buy one that's too stiff and then they're not able to break it in properly. The boots made of leather are aesthetically pleasing. Um, they mold nicely, um, but again, sometimes they break down too quickly for the athlete, so they need something a little more sturdy. When they're training, they also sweat into their leather boots, and the leather, the sweat quite often doesn't dry out between their their training sessions and the sweat in there and the dampness makes the leather break down even sooner. When the boot is breaking in, it's one thing. As it starts to break down, it doesn't offer the stability. And as the boot breaks in, you hope the boot breaks in slowly enough that the skater's musculoskeletal system can mature at the same time or train at the same time to make up for the little bit of give that the boot is giving so they don't occur injuries. So this is just a list of some of the overuse injuries that you get. Shin splints, stress fractures. One in five, 20% of the skaters will have a stress fracture in their career. Tendonitis, hip strains, patellofemoral pain, back strain, and that apophysitis, that is just a, a name for um, inflammation at the growth plates in our younger skaters, such as that knee x-ray I showed, I showed you, and that occurs at the heel, the knee and the hip. So the facts are that landing impact is eight to 10 times the body weight. And the forces are transmitted if they're not absorbed in the boot and the ankle, they're transmitted up the leg to the back. We know that the design properties and the materials of the skate affect the uh, mechanical function of the joints. We know that by increasing the range of motion of the ankle, we can decrease the impact by 20 to 30%.
and changing the materials in the construction of the boot can increase absorption of the landing force. So in summary, with the boot analysis, we want skates, skates are essentially an extension of the body and should fit like a glove. It's the way the body uses its energy, its kinetic energy, to translate into motion across the ice. We want the boot to be flexible to move, to absorb the forces through the joints properly, but we also want the foot to be uh, able to move in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, but we want it to be supported in the position of the boot so that it's stable in medial lateral or side-to-side -side motion. So when we're looking, and we want the boot to have a lifespan so it doesn't wear out. So we look at, at the static fit versus the dynamic fit of the boot, the stability versus the flexibility of the boot, the breaking in as opposed to breaking down for the longevity of the boot. And we need a design and a material uh, properties of the boot that will meet the demands of our skaters so they can skate to their potential. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce um, Peter Zappolo. He's an exercise physiologist and is the director of the medical science program for the United States Figuring Skating Association. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to those who are watching on the live stream. We're um, very pleased that you could join us. Um, I'm going to um, talk today about many of the topics that Dr. Moran brought up um, and focus really on the impact of landing impact. And we're talking about the physiological demands in figure skating. And, um, you know, we certainly can talk uh, very much about our ice dancers as well. Um, but today I will be focusing on specifically jumps and landing impact. And um, I want to talk to you today about some of the challenges that are being created in our sport and to our athletes' bodies um, because of dealing with repeated landing impact with high impact forces and, and high, in, high training volumes. So we have a body of research and I'm going to introduce you to some of our key researchers in the United States. Um, everything that I am going to discuss today has been published. Um, we have one paper in review right now um, <clears throat> that I'll talk about, but um, I encourage you um, to, to go online and look at some of these studies. Um, for those of you here um, today, uh, the handout that I've passed around, and if you don't have one, Sanda has some more at the front, um, is really, a, that's an abstract from Cat Arbor, who did kind of the key study in landing impact in 2012, SRPHD work. Um, I want to talk to you about the applications of technology and what we're using um, in, in terms of te technologic initiatives for both research and in practice. And so um, for the coaches, really taking a practical approach of how are you going to protect your athlete because you were, as Jane says, we are always pushing these athletes to do more and perform more and more difficult tricks. And you look at Junior Worlds this year and the spectacular jumps that the juniors were doing. Um, including the ladies doing quads, which was so exciting, but to protect these young athletes while they're doing this. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So I, I, it's, it's really a great honor to be invited by the ISU to present here today. I want to thank the ISU and of course the hospitality of the Italians this week has been wonderful. Um, I wanna thank US Figure Skating and the USOC for supporting this work. Um, and these are the scientists that in the United States had have really done some of the um, work, uh, particularly with landing impact and protecting the body. So, um, and I have some contact information at the end of my presentation and they encourage you to reach out to them directly um, if you have questions. 
Cat Arbor, um, who is currently in Boston, um, did kind of the pivotal study in landing impact in 2012. She studied with Dr. Jim Richards at the University of Delaware. Um, that's where um, we have a 3D simulation system where we can actually um, do kinematic tracking and simulation of skating jumps. Um, also training at University of Delaware and they're now professors at BYU is Sarah Traeger Ridge and Dustin Brunning. And they are doing a direct measure of landing impact by instrumenting a skate. And we're going to, I'm going to show you that in a second. And then in terms of looking at movement mechanics, and I know we're going to hear a little bit more from some of our other speakers about movement mechanics, um, kind of the team that, that I'm working with um, is Lindsay Slater at Northwestern University and Kristen Skyton at U of M. Um, Lindsay's a biomechanist and Kristen's a, a physical therapist, um, looking at evaluating and correcting movement mechanics and fundamental movement patterns. And these are going to be very important for protecting the skater's body um, against repeated jump impact. And then going further back in the literature, um, one of the USOC biomechanists, Sarah Smith, and um, Deb King, who's a biomechanist at Ithaca University, they did some of the important initial studies in 3D jump mechanics. And Deb is continuing her work in skating. And there's actually a paper that was uh, December 2017 that's an injury survey that encompassed um, athletes between 2011 and 2017. And then looking to our coaches, I'd like to highlight Christy Crawl, um, you know, coach of world champion Patrick Chan, and many world and Olympic competitors. She was here this week, um, and how she applies some of this. So why do we care about jump impact? Well, I'm not going to go into the injuries because that's going to be discussed otherwise, but um, kind of all the literature that's out there is, is, is very much in agreement, or there seems to be a, um, an agreement between the different retrospective surveys that about half of the injuries in skating are coming from overuse versus acute injuries, and a lot are related to jumping, with um, jumping injuries more than half being in the lower extremity in the skater. So if our goals really are to keep athletes healthy, our goals are to keep the athletes healthy and on the ice, and to simultaneously progress their skills and training at maximal speed. So we want to be able to push them along, have them continue to develop, but protect their bodies at the same time. So that's why we care about the jump impact forces. So when we talk about what's contributing to um, the injuries coming from jump impact, we have high impact forces. So that kind of leads us to the question, what are the forces associated with landing impact? And as we said, lower extremity, what parts of the body are most affected? In skating, we have a high training volume. Um, I think um, Jane summarized that very well. So what is the relationship between the number of jumps and overuse injuries occurring and how many jumps is too many and that's what's very difficult for coaches and for skaters and their parents is you know skater a can do you know 50 triple lutzes to no ill effect and skater b can do 10 and she's injured so what's why, why is there a difference and how many jumps is too many for each skater so that brings me to preparing and repairing the body so how can we train our athletes to be resistant to repeated landing impact force? And one of the other big um, aspects that we focus on is what is the role of recovery and nutrition when we talk about preparation and repair of the body? Some of the other factors that are going to affect our injury risk and our skills acquisition in skating is jump technique. Um, proper technique absolutely uh, is extremely important and proper technique um, reduces the amount of landing impact that our skaters face. Um, athleticism or athletic qualities of the, of the body. So I'm going to define that today as the strength of the body in movement and in tissue strength, the tissue strength of the body. Fundamental movement qualities. Is the athlete able to balance? Is the athlete able to align um, everything that, that Dr. Moran was talking about in terms of um, being able to stand over your feet and have um, forces appropriately transmitted through the body. And then what about training the fatigued athlete? And we all deal with this, you know, when the athlete is toast and, and overtrained. And so now the, the, all these qualities that we've worked so hard to, to foster in the athletes are breaking down because the athlete is, is very tired. So now our training becomes inefficient and we increase the risk of acute, acute and overuse injury. So when we talk about landing impact, and here, here we have Miss Nagasu doing the triple axle of the Olympics, which we are very proud of. Um, we've got this 
um, ground reaction force of her pushing off on the takeoff and then the impact of landing. So when we look at impact, and here I have Mr. Chen doing a, a quad flip combination, um, we have this takeoff impact um, that's transmitted and then, and, and I, I was joking with them yesterday, I said, you know, you're making this face because you know you're going to hit the ice so hard um, on your landing impact. So here's his landing impact. And then as Jane was saying, we can see how it transmits up the body. So we have that initial impact um, with the blade into the ice, into the foot, ankle, knee, hip, and low back. So. I did some photography very close up of these, you know, instantaneous moments of landing impact. So we have a toe strike where that toe first comes down on the ice. And then within a split second, we have that free leg coming through and the weight shifting toward the back of the blade. And then the athletes checked into a landing position and gliding on the landing edge. This is a tiny fraction of time. We're talking about 0.02 to 0.05 seconds uh, for that edge to come slamming down onto the ice, okay? And then the entire, from, from initial toe strike all the way to the check position is going to happen in less than, than three tenths of a second. So we're talking about a tiny sliver of time when we're talking about landing impact. So when we try to investigate landing impact, that makes it quite difficult because we're, we're, we have to detect it in a, in a tiny sliver of time. So. As you probably know, measuring the force on the ice is fairly difficult. We don't have force plates under most of our ice rinks. Um, and um, it would be nice, maybe, maybe, maybe the ISU can build this one. Um, I'll get right on it. You'll get right on that, <laughs> great. Um, one of the initial studies um, that Dr. Richards tried was um, using an insole pressure device. And, and these are becoming, the technology is coming along, but it's still not quite, quite there. Um, one of the big issues was, as we talk about that tiny time interval, the sampling rate of your, um, of your pressure device has to be very, very high in terms of hertz. And so the, at the time that this research was originally done, the insoles that were commercially available couldn't sample fast enough to catch that landing impact spike. So what um, kind of the initial approach was to use 3D tracking, because you can do that with a pretty high frame rate and look at joint kinematics. So one of the, one of the earlier studies, which was with Dustin Burning and, and Jim Richards at the University of Delaware in 2006, was they looked at, um, they estimated on ice ground reaction force um, with single and double axles. And so they were using, you know, they were doing 3D tracking of the jumps to look at acceleration, um, some, you know, hideous amount of math in there, and then they can estimate a ground reaction force that was about eight to eight and a half times body weight at the time of the heel strike. And just as a reference, um, a runner's gonna impact about three and a half times body weight to heel strike. But the pivotal study was Cat Arbor in 2012. So she wanted to look at the magnitude of tibial shock. So that area right on the front of the ankle um, and what happens at the, with, on impact, what's the acceleration on impact um, at the shin of a skater. So she used a wireless accelerometer, it's a very small device. Um, that was strapped to the skater's shin. It really didn't affect their technique. They didn't really know it was there. Um, and it was sampling at a very high rate. Um, I think she was sampling at 1,000 hertz. Um, and so you can't directly measure ground reaction force with an accelerometer, but you can estimate the ground reaction force with a tibial shock. And what she looked at, she had, she had 25 skaters, and she studied 349 jumps that the 29, 25 skaters performed. So she wanted to look at which variables are gonna affect tibial shock. So she looked at number of rotations, so singles, doubles, triples. There were no athletes that could do quads um, in her study. Um, she looked at the type of the jump, so she looked at the six different type, jump types. She looked at joint kinematics at landing, so basically with the 3D camera system, what were the joints doing in the lower extremity, and then she looked at the height of the jump. And then her skater variables were the functional strength of the skater, and that was a functional strength test that she, um, that she generated with a, they, I think they did repeated box jumps and on a force plate to look at um, how consistently they could perform um, repeated jumps. She looked at the body mass or the weight of the skater, 
consistency. So there were 18 jumps performed by each skater. So she wanted to look at how uh, many jumps they were able to perform out of the 18. And then um, she was looking at how far they could dorsiflect in the skate. So I'm gonna highlight briefly some of the findings that were important. Um, in looking at takeoff versus landing tibial shock, for loop, flip, and LUTs, the takeoff tibial shock was significantly less than landing. It was about 20 Gs. So you think about Mirai pushing off on that triple axle and then landing. So for loop, flip, and LUTs, it was significantly less um, on the takeoff than it was on the landing for both males and females. So about 20 Gs on takeoff and almost 60 Gs on landing. There was not significant gender differences on the takeoff, but males had a significantly greater tibial shock on the landing, and we can infer that that's because men tend to jump higher and they weigh more. So that would, in, that would explain the um, higher landing tibial shock. Does jump type affect tibial shock? It doesn't. There's no significant difference. Again, the average was about 56 Gs on jump landing. Does the number of rotations affect tibial shock? And I'm speaking to the medical professionals and the coaches out there that may be creating return to plays, return to play plans for injured athletes, and that's something I do quite often um, with the coaches and the medical practitioners. And so you say, well, go to your program and just do singles. Well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of difference in landing impact between singles, doubles, and triples. So there wasn't a significant difference between rotation types. The average was still 56G. And um, there wasn't a big difference in jump height between singles, doubles, and triples. What about jump quality? So what about jumps that the athletes under rotate, ones that they fall on, jumps that they pop, or jumps that they step out? So Kat paired in each skater, she paired jumps, like the same jump, let's say it's a triple toe, one that they did cleanly versus perhaps one they popped or one they fell on or one they stepped out of. And what's very interesting is other than falls, um, the landing impact was actually higher for missed jumps. And, and the one I always highlight with our athletes is popping, and I don't know, I, I know none of the coaches here have poppers, but um, if you do, that landing impact is actually higher. So one of the things that we do when we're doing return to play is we might give a rather strict jump count to athletes coming back from an injury, um, maybe a stress reaction, um, injury and so they have to count everything including pops so we really want efficient practice and you know that's a great message to the coaches that hey those pops count big time so in kind of cat's conclusions were regardless of how much a skater weighed their functional strength their proficiency their jump type how many rotations they could do or how many rotations were in the jump and miss versus a, a successful landing the tibial shock at takeoff was about 21 Gs, plus or minus two Gs. The tibial shock at landing was 56 Gs, plus or minus two Gs. So we're looking at impact forces 10 times greater than the impact forces in running for skating. There wasn't significant differences in the type of jump, rotations and jump, clean versus under, versus pop versus fall. So when we look at what reduces tibial shock, and I'm gonna, there's a lot of the same themes that, that Jane was talking about, a greater ankle dorsiflexion position at heel strike is gonna reduce your tibial shock. A greater ankle range of motion between the toe strike and the heel strike, so how pointed your toe is to how much you can bend that ankle. How long the duration is between the toe strike and the heel strike, and we'll talk about that in a second. And a lower body mass. So skaters that were lighter had a lower tibial shock. On the flip side of that coin is basically the opposite. If it's quick between that toe and the heel, your tibial shock increases, restricting the ankle range of motion. So some of the issues that, that Jane talked about with boots certainly is going to affect tibial shock. A higher jump height, pop jumps are gonna have a slightly greater tibial shock and a higher body mass. The problem is when, we're, when she did this study, and this was a key limitation, Tibial shock is not ground reaction force, so it's not a direct measurement of the force that's transmitting to the skater. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to measure direct impact force? So we go to our team at BYU, and this is what they've created. So this is an instrumented blade, and this is published. Um, so what you have here is um, strain gauges actually in the skate blade itself. So of course you're thinking, who's going to wear this, and are they crazy? 
Um, but they <clears throat> have instrumented the skate blade um, with a strain gauge and then their collection device. So they can actually measure deformity in the skate blade and thereby directly measure ground reaction force um, on jump landing impact. And this actually works quite well. Um, there's obvious challenges um, and, uh, to both the technology and the size um, and getting athletes used to skating in the instrumented skates so that they can participate in the study. So this is an athlete wearing it in the lab and so they're calibrating it here in a force plate and they actually have been able to calibrate it both while the athlete's wearing it and also just by dropping it onto a force plate. Um, here's the athlete, they kind of Velcro it up in a little, little bag and they wore it on the ice and they, they don't really think about it. Um, I, I think that convincing more elite athletes to wear this might be challenging. Um, the proof of concept works quite well there, there are definitely reliability issues to this approach. Um, the temperature on the ice and water has been a challenge in terms of getting consistent measurements um, and calibration with the device. So I think we're a little bit waiting for technology to, to catch up and miniaturize, but um, this is very interesting. Um, and there's a preliminary study that's been published here, um, but keep, you know, as they say, stay tuned. So, what other technologies could we be using if, if you know, I don't, I don't see us all going out and getting these instrumented skate blades for our athletes to wear in training. But there are technologies available that are less obtrusive that our, that our athletes can use now. So I think everyone's seen, you know, everyone in this room that has an iPhone or, or a, a smartphone, everyone around the world that's listening that has a smartphone, you have an inertial measurement unit. You have, probably have multiple IMUs in your smartphone right now. And an IMU is a, is a, um, a multi-axis gyroscope that measures acceleration and forces and orientation. Some, some of them measure magnetic field. Um, so in this illustration, I have a picture of an athlete wearing one on each wrist. And that's about the size that the complex ones are right now. They're, they're, um, they're quite small. Um, on the right-hand side, that's a picture of the vert. And I don't know if anyone's seen that. It's a commercially available IMU. Um, we have had not great results in figure skating with it. Um, I don't know if it's because of the rotational forces, but um, it works really well for off-ice jumping in terms of measuring jump height and doing jump count. But that's an inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, commercially available IMU with an iPhone app um, or an Android app that can count, that can measure jump height and count jumps. So. The problems that we're experiencing right now with IMUs is good ones are, are expensive. Um, the good ones have a lot of sensitivity and I'm going to show you what that looks like when you're running a skating program. So we may need to, you have to really tune the data that you're getting from an IMU to make it useful. And the problem is that the cheaper ones that are available, the manufacturers, like the vert manufacturers, won't give you access to the raw sensor data. So you're getting some kind of process data that's coming through their app. And so there's really limited use in skating unless you can get access to that raw sensor data. So this is what it looks like when you connect, collect IMU data during a skating program. So all those, all that jagged lines that you see is vertical uh, acceleration, radio acceleration, radial acceleration, and rotational velocity throughout about half of a skating routine. So here's a tiny snippet that we've taken out. And this, this paper is in review right now. Um, and this is one jump in a novice men's uh, program. And so this is the sensor data. So basically at this point, we need to do a lot more data collection to be able to design software that can more easily snip out um, and recognize jumps that are happening. The, the good news is it works quite well. Um, the BYU team has been able to create uh, an IMU uh, a jump counter that works very well and, and detects the jumps but doesn't detect things that aren't jumps or doesn't count things that aren't jumps as jumps. Um, so, you know, stay tuned, but that's moving, moving forward nicely. In practice, um, you know, we want to create sensors that can calculate jump height, rotational rate, and total time at the peak rotational rate, which will be very useful, I think, to coaches when you're trying to optimize um, jumps for your athletes. But we're going to have to collect more data to be able to figure out um, how, to, how to tease this information from the IMUs. So when we talk about putting it into practice, um, you know, we've learned about jump impact and we're learning more about monitoring jump count. So how are we going to 
use this in practice with the coaches. So going back to what Jane said, um, you know, what increases the force of impact is the pore shock absorbing interface of the skate and the surface. So the boot design for sure, and the restriction of the ankle because the duration of the impact is going to change the force put through the foot and the ankle. So if we can increase this duration of impact, we can lessen the force transmitted into the body. So how are we going to do this? Well, a lot of it's gonna come back to the training of the skater and proper movement mechanics are going to help protect the body and increase the performance of the skater. So one of the things that we're really emphasizing right now is soft tissue mobilization, particularly in the lower extremity. So preparing the body tissues every day before the athlete skates, training that's including stability, including strength and proprioception of the lower extremity and the core, and especially emphasizing control and alignment and high quality of movement. And a lot of this needs to be rehearsed off the ice as well as on the ice. So there we have Mr. Chen showing us his off-ice routine with core and uh, his posterior chain and his foot and ankle. On the right-hand side, that's just one example of some of the tools. I mean, you, it doesn't take much. Just a lacrosse ball is just fine to roll out your soft tissues. So what we're doing now, and this is something that um, I referred to Lindsay Slater and Kristen Skyton and myself have created a movement screen to evaluate athletes' abilities to move and control their movement in their body. So that's something that we do with our top athletes. Um, and we've made it available to all US figure skating athletes is to do a movement screen and give them feedback on their fundamental movement mechanics. We focus on key areas important to landing impact and jump performance. So again, core, posterior chain, foot and ankle, and we also do shoulders. We wanna to emphasize to our athletes and coaches that soft tissue mobilization is not stretching alone. Okay, it's mobilizing the soft tissue so that their bodies are able to move in a way that is going to help them perform better and hopefully guard against injury. And we try to incorporate this into their daily routine. We try to use soft tissue mobilization as a warm up, and I think it's really catching on. And then training the stability of the joints in the same areas to increase the athlete's alignment, um, improve their performance, and create injury resistance. So to conclude, Athletes and coaches are facing a lot of challenges to reduce physiological stresses, particularly related to jump landing impact, high jump volume, high landing impact forces, challenges with the equipment, as we've talked about, training to create strong bodies, and creating excellent fundamental movement mechanics in our athletes. And then finally, inadequate recovery of our athletes so that they're ready to do it again, as Jane said, six days a week. So if we were making a list of action items to enhance performance and reduce effects of landing impact, this is my, this is my list. Progressing training appropriately for the time of season and the stage of development of the athlete and monitoring jump numbers is a big part of that. Choosing appropriate equipment, lacing your boots correctly, and repairing and replacing equipment as needed. Training for tissue mobility and joint stability and then working specifically on fundamental movement mechanics that enhance the athlete's lower extremity alignment, particularly in deceleration, and this is going to support jump technique and also um, make you injury resistant. So I just wanna finish by thanking everyone. This is contact information for our scientists. Again, they encourage you to reach out to them directly, um, and I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Peter, that was very good, giving us a lot of things to think about and perhaps uh, implement and uh, look forward to the future. Thank you very much. Our next speech speaker is uh, Dr. David Ternazzi, and he is the Chief of uh, Rehabilita Re Rehabilitation Department at the um, Galazier Orthopedic Institute in Milan. He's been the Italian figure skating uh, team physician since uh, 2001, and he's a scientific director of uh, the Milan Lab. Welcome, David.
How's everyone doing? You okay? And everyone at home has the advantage that we can't see what they're doing, so they're probably lounging on their couch and having a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Suzanne and Jane, for this invitation. Um, when Jane asked me to talk about figure skating injuries, the first problem was for me to make this 20 minutes interesting, because I suppose that you all know about the basic of uh, most common injuries in figure skating, because you are the top coaches of top athletes, so you know uh, about uh, stress fractures, ankle sprains, uh, low back pain, and so on. Um, some introductive thoughts. Uh, the modern tendency in sport is uh, mainly towards the athletic and physical aspect in order to gain a spectacularization of the performance and the introduction of uh, new materials and technologies and uh, the research and commercial pushing uh, went in, in this direction. We can think about the, the source of soccer shoes, skis, skis boots, tennis rackets, the costume in swimming, uh, doping um, material. This is the physical profile of uh, soccer players in the major league in Italy. We see that in two decades, the, the weight and the height grow of four kilograms and four centimeters so, with the same BMI. So now the players are most powerful, more powerful than 20 years, 20 years ago. But if I look my beautiful pinball, I think that there hasn't been a revolution about materials, and that's the way we have to, to follow. But the revolution in materials doesn't, uh, had not to be through uh, an increasing of, of, the, of the performance, because our athletes are very performing, performing perhaps too much, and uh, but uh, must be um, towards skate herself. And the physical profile is different than some years ago, but uh, our athletes are not heavier and not taller, like, for example, the soccer players. In late 2003, the ISU medical advisor stated that uh, skaters spend more time in free skating, training the technical elements, and there has been a rapid progression in uh, physiological demands of free skating programs. And there will also be um, a tend for children to begin training seriously at younger ages. Competitive figure skating uh, actually is much less about artistry and much more about athleticism than in years past. Each one can have an opinion about this if his uh, most memorable uh, artistic program, program or an athletic program. The new rules have dramatically increased the physical demands placed on the athletes for example, judges reward skaters with bonus points if they put the most physical challenging elements in the second half of the program. And the elimination of school figures permitted skaters to spend more time in uh, practicing technical elements. And, and as uh, Jane said, our athletes train six days a week 11 months, 
a year, up to six hours a day. So what can we do to look after skater's health? Uh, first of all, the coach's education. You, have, uh, you must have principles of medicine in order, in order to uh, recognize the beginning of the problem before it becomes a problem. You must have knowledge of exercise physiology and biomechanics. Uh, there must be strong communication between the technical staff and the medical staff and doctors must collect epidemiologic data in order to talk with the ISU medical advisor that will, be, will bring the problems to technical committee. This is an example of a good job that the ISU med medical um, advisor did uh, in this year. In 2004, uh, the introduction of the new rules um, did this problem. Um, we had a lot of lumbar spine overload and so of low back pain due to the full donut ring position during lifts. It was a sort of shortcut to get the level four. Um, Matteo Zanni uh, mounted this video for this seminar. It's not too long. And there's the music. No music. Anyway, we see the dun full donut ring position during the lift. And this was the rule. Each of us can have an opinion about the originality of these lifts. They were very similar, just the difficult was to put the blade behind the head. In 2014, uh, a trick was introduced in the rules so that it was necessary the interaction between the skaters during the lift and this solved the problem because the shortcut became a uh, sort of marathon, and now we see uh, lifts more original and less stressed on the lumbar spine. Um, when we talk about stress fractures, we think about lower limbs. Um, we know that stress fracture is a fracture caused by cumulative repetitive strain and excesses activity, uh, practically figure skating. And stress fractures account about for 10% of sports injuries with 0.7 up to 15% of athletic presenting with stress fractures. In a classic work on uh, article on American Journal of Sport Medicine, tibia was the most involved and represented bone followed by tarsus, metatarsus, femur, and so on. Rarely, the upper extremities um, were represented. Now I want to talk about a uh, um, case report I, I had to face in 2014, um, just before the Olympics. 
In the picture, we see a stationary lift. The lady began practicing this uh, specific, specific position um, in nearly August 2013, having repeated the technique about 500 times between August and November. Then she became to have pain at the forearm. Um, for the first time in her career, the athlete has started to use her left hand instead of the right uh, to hold the boot blade uh, for executing the rim position. And uh, the athlete uh, would reach uh, for the blade during the lift after rotation had begun rather than just before starting the element. In so doing, uh, the torsional stress was probably exponentially higher and uh, in the picture we see the, the stress fracture. Um, the athlete didn't stop the activity. She did nationals, Europeans, Olympics and worlds. But we modified the stationary lift uh, whereby the lifting partner would grab the dancer's blade before lifting her so that she could hold her in position without stresses on the left forearm and in the picture, there is the fracture healed. So, some consideration. Uh, some of the technical elements in ice dancing, uh, not only in uh, singles or pair, or pair, can overload the, the structures of the body due to the sometimes extremely difficult position that the skater must repeatedly practice uh, to control them. The ISU rules permit a wide range of technical elements to be implemented uh, in order to create uh, an original program uh, challenging for the skater and aesthetically pleasing in order to gain the highest scores. And the ability to obtain uh, the balance while maintaining skater self is for us all imperative. Uh, just one consideration about the jumper's knee. Jane talked about uh, the problem of uh, the heel during uh, jumping in, uh, in figure skating. In the picture, there is a simple clinical test that can be used to diagnose a patellar tendinopathy. Uh, the, the patient must perform a mini squat and if we think this is right, the, the situation that the skater has to face at all the jumping landing, this situation overload the patellar tendon and the extensor mechanism of the knee. The last topic is about the hip and where are we going? Uh, the presence of hepatology uh, may be the result of an acute injury or an overuse syndrome like for all the other joints of the body. Uh, artistic sports like dance, figure skating, gymnastics may predispose athletes to hip injuries uh, because of the repetitive extreme range of motion in the hip joint during the performance. Labral tears, cold defects, Tearing of the ligamentum tears or joint instability are so common. Uh, the acceleration phase in figure skating requires a push off motion of the hip um, in abduction and external rotation that may predispose to hip problems. In groin pain, the pelvis is a crossroad of intense and asymmetric stress. As, uh, and is typically involved at the side used to crossing in front during the, the flight phase. At the takeoff and the closing, a strength and fast eccentric concentric contraction of hip flexors and uh, con concentric of adductors is needed. And at the landing with the opening, eccentric contraction both of hip flexors and adductors happen. Preparing the jump, there is a combined action at abdominal and adductor 
the synth, uh, public synthesis. In S dance, we have problem due to very deep positions uh, during the technical technical elements. Um, we talk about apophysitis. Uh, in Ilia crest, apophysitis is an injury that may be seen more often in teenage figure skaters performing difficult jumps. Uh, in order to rotate quickly, enough to complete the revolutions, uh, um, the netter, um, uh, a significant torque must be created by the um, oblique muscles and the repetitions, uh, the repetitive pull at the open physis of the iliac crest can lead to an apophysitis. This is the last physis that closes in our, in our body. Um, I looked for some articles about hip uh, overloading during uh, not activities, activity of daily living, but during sports. I just found this data about an elementary exercise like the counter moving jump. At takeoff, uh, there is a loading of 5.5 per body weight and the landing of 6.0. Ilia crest, apophysitis, and groin pain are extra articular disease symptomatic. So when there is a problem, we can uh, decide to do physiotherapy, less strains, depending on the situation. But labral pathologies and joint overload has a need in the boot and sometimes hidden is the development. So my, if you ask me well, how, were, how will be our skaters in the next 15 years at the hips, I, I don't know, I haven't an answer, so where are we going with this situation about jumps, quads, repeated during the, the season? I bring the farewell from all the doctors that are us in, in this week to make uh, this uh, a special occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for presenting that uh, very thorough and um, presentation on injuries, including the lower and upper extremity. Your case on your ice dancer was an uh, excellent uh, uh, um, example of the changing of the rules, making an injury prevalent that wasn't there before, and your ability to change that by changing the technique of the skater resolved the problem. So, good things to know. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Sven Orthensen. He's uh, going to speak on um, preventing injuries through muscle technique and exercise. And uh, uh, Sven is a previous ice dancer, and he was a national champion, he was a coach, and he's now an orthopedic surgeon, so he comes very well qualified to speak to the coaches today. And I'd welcome uh, Sven here. He's been the German figure skating doctor and uh, since 2001? For the Federation? For the Federation. 2005. 2005. And he's been to many Europeans, seven Europeans, uh, eight, eight world championships, and a couple Olympic games. So he, uh, he's... And I'm not the only one. <laughs> we meet every year. Yes, we meet every year. Yeah. <laughs> so please welcome Sven. Thanks, Sven. Um, the presentation can be seen there. Is that fine? Yeah, great. Thank you for having me, Jane and uh, Susanna. Um, so I was wondering what, what can I contribute to this? And um, I thank Peter except, uh, especially for this very interesting uh, presentation and you, you already started to talk about special exercises that the athletes can do before practice and uh, during off, comp off, uh, off ice. So um, I thought maybe I'd talk about um, prevention of muscle injuries and uh, I didn't do this alone because I had the great help of Marianne Martin who was our, um, one of our two physiotherapists here uh, in the German Federation. She was here during the world, maybe the one, one of the other has seen them, seen her, but um, she left now. So I have to do it alone. This is the place I normally do work in. Um, uh, we have enough space to do some diagnosis and some therapy in there. Um, 
And the first question that everybody exposes himself is, why do muscle injuries happen at all? Well, we have two basic reasons, mostly. It's first the accident, like a, a collision or a, a, a fall. And second, it's, of course, the overuse. And uh, normally you tend to think um, you don't have any influence on, on an accident. Well, maybe you don't, but you have a great influence on the outcome of the accident, like how you can react to the collision or react to the fall, react to the fall. Sorry for my English. And um, the more a muscle is fit for a training, we can say the more he is also fit for an accident. So these are two sides of the medal, I would say. And um, what now defines muscular fitness? What is that? Well, first, it's the absolute strength, the stability of the muscle. Um, it's the question of balance between the left and right side or the extensor or flexor uh, side of a muscle. It's the coordination, which means both the coordination between muscular groups, but also in the muscle itself. The um, fatigability, so how, how tired will he in, uh, be, the muscle, in what time? And uh, what does he get to eat? So the nutrition. So being an orthopedic for myself, these are all the factors that influence each other. So if you um, have a bad coordination, the stability is not good. If you have a bad nutrition, the fatigability is not good. So they all work and work into each other, those factors. So being an orthopedic for myself, I first uh, concentrate on the first three parts of this. And I start with the imbalances, because um, in my everyday work, and uh, I work with athletes, not only figure skaters, but um, tennis players, soccer players, whatever, um, these imbalances do occur a lot. And for there, I, I tend to um, make a difference between static and muscle imbalances. Uh, also, these two influence each other, as everybody might know. Um, I, and um, it's always when we say muscle, we all have to consider also that it's not only the muscle, but the whole configuration of the bones, the ankles, the tendons, the ligaments, and um, the fascia. And um, when we go to analyze static imbalances, we can see that maybe those static imbalances can, you, can produce a lot of problems. First, headache and neck pain, and shoulder problems and low back pain, and muscle injuries, there we go, knee pain and uh, stability problems of the ankle. Um, what I do then in my everyday job after a, cl a thorough clinical examination is to maybe do a 3D spine scan, which I show you in a minute, um, then a dynamic footprint analysis and a treadmill analysis of the athlete. Um, all this I do in cooperation with maybe dentists, with ophthalmolo ophthalmologists, um, because we have seen that all or many problems also can occur from visual abnormalities and um, abnormalities of the, uh, of the maxilla and mandibula. So, um, a 3D sky, spine scan is pretty simple. The athlete stands in front of a blue screen and we have a laser, um, lasers, uh, how you call it? A laser radar sign which scans the back. We have the athlete um, do some exercises, some um, movements, and we can pretty good see First, the shape of the, of the um, spine, but also how it reacts to different, different, um, different stresses. Um, from then, we can do a footprint analysis uh, with, uh, with some sensors that are in the, uh, in the sole. The athlete walks and runs around, and from then we can have a pretty good, um, pretty good view of the pressure that is on the foot. Also, we can use it for doing insoles um, if needed. And last point, in this analysis, 
from the static point is to have a Tradman analysis with a high-speed camera. Well, this is not. Um, and if you put all those three factors together, we can, we can see where the athlete has imbalances, static imbalances, which means does he have any wrong ankle position, does he, which, which would need an insole, does he need, um, does he need uh, manual therapy or osteopathy or may, might he need tooth corrections, which also could be a factor. So this is the my, like external help that the athlete can get, I would say. Um, the other point are the muscle imbalances. Um, also then we start, of course, with the clinical examination. Um, we do a functional EMG analysis, which I'm going to show you in a second. And then, if needed, we do a test screening, a screening test, a test battery, which is called functional movement screening. Um, in that, we need desperately to cooperate, we doctors and desperately need to cooperate with the physiotherapists, of course. Um, the EMG analysis, which is, uh, shows me disbalances between, like for here in example, in the, in, the, um, in the thigh, between the vastus medialis, the medial muscle of the thigh, and the lateral muscle of the thigh, which, if they are not properly in balance, do have an impact of the patella, to be lateralized or not, for example, and then we can do like EMG analysis. Um, the functional movement screening test is a test battery that was developed, I think, in the US like 10 or 15 years ago. It's long, but it still has a lot of influence and it still can be used very well, so I would everybody, I recommend everybody to have a look at it. It's simple, you can reproduce it. The Im muscle imbalances can clearly be detected. The testing um, is also of flexibility, of stability, and of coordination in one step. And that's exactly what I wanted to do, yeah? In one step, I have all my three key items that I want to have them. So, um, the advantage is, is also, and that comes back to Peter again, you don't test isolated muscles, but you test the movement. It's not, uh, I mean, getting stability and getting a better muscle does not mean to go to the fitness studio and be in the machine and do like maximum uh, power, but you have to train the movement. Um, if you train that movement, the muscle develops accordingly. He doesn't have a chance, he has to, and he wants to. And uh, the athlete can get an individual plan out of that functional movement screening tests. You have less injuries, less overuse, and all in all, you might get a better performance. Yeah, what is that now? It's seven relatively simply ex simple exercises which we go through. Um, the deep squat, the hurdle step, inline lunges, shoulder mobility tests, the active straight leg raise test, trunk stability push-ups, and rotational stability. And to go through that, I have um, some examples, and maybe one or the other know those two athletes, uh, Aljona and Bruno, and um, I asked them if I should, could publish this here, and they were happy to have that. So, um, and it's not, not a great um, secret that I tell that Aljona had ankle stability problems following an injury in November 2016 when she wanted to try, land a triple axle. And also, Bruno, everybody knows he has recurrent back problems. That's not nothing, no secret. And in, last thing, which doesn't have really to do, but um, just to mention, um, in the years before this actual season, they had recurrent infections, like flus and colds, and everyone had like four or three days off, and then the other one, and so they had lum, some losses in, the, um, in their training process, preparing for the competitions. Um, the infections we try to solve by changing in their nutrition, just to come back on that. Um, and the f screening tests, just to pr get them better prepared with their backs and the ankle stabilities we did in last summer. Uh, we did some filming. Here you see the landing of Iona during this triple axle. And uh, yeah, Bruno wearing his belt all the time, actually. Um, 
So deep squat, the first test, and I put them parallel so you can see what they do. And you being a professional coach, you see the differences, I might say. You can see that uh, Bruno uh, evades the movement. He goes into a hyperlumbar position. He doesn't have the necessary flexibility in the hip, I would say. Um, while Ayona in that test is pretty fine. Then you have the hurdle step, which is a good test for ankle stability. And um, while, oh sorry, that was too fast. While Bruno doesn't have any serious problem with that, Ayona, even on the, she's standing on her not landing foot, she's trying to balance more and more. And when they change to the other side, to, to her landing foot, you do make three and three of each side as a test. And normally we have firming AP and lateral, but you can see that she really has, well, what does she do there? Uh, problems to get stabilized, both in the ankle, but also in the hip. Yeah, she, she evades the, the whole process there. Okay, next test would be the inline lunges. Sorry, I don't have the AP filming. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get it. In that, I would say they were both fine. No greater complications in that. Shoulder mobility tests, uh, I just show you the pictures because that was fine as well. They didn't have any uh, issue on that. Active straight leg raise. You remember Bruno had a problem with the mobility of the hip, of the front part. Um, he doesn't have any problem with the mobility in the back part, so he can actively straight it more than 90 degrees, which was nothing. Also, the other side didn't, didn't do anything. Okay, we can skip that because that was good. Um, trunk stability push-up. Simple push-ups, if you want to say, but also there you can see slight difference. Uh, Bruno is very stable, while Ayona already gets into the hyperflexion. Um, so we had to work a bit on the hip stability again and the trunk stability of Iona in, in this area. And um, the last and the most, inf uh, most interesting test was rotational stability. And I can tell you Iona was fine on that, so I don't show you that, but Bruno with his back problems. Um, we have two sections in that. The, this is a diagonal test which is a bit simpler, and he was okay with that. He did some movements in there, but he was quite fine. Yep. Okay, this is, but this is okay. But when it comes to the a little bit harder section, um, parallel, he has his stability problems on that. Yeah, always tends to fall a bit. Oops, I keep... Oh. So he's doing the other side now. And it's pretty easy to see where he is comfortable with and where not. So. Um, so now it's, it's, the, it's the right side, and also there he tends to, tends to fall. Come on. Yes. Oops. Okay, you see what I mean, yeah? Mm -hmm. So when we did that, screening the results um, were put into, into like a sheet, and this sheet you can reproduce. So can you, you can keep it, do the retest, re evaluation three months later or so, and so the athlete has something to, to stick to. For this couple we had, um, so we saw we had to work on the hip, hip extension of Bruno and the rotational stabili stability for Ayuna, the ankle stability and the hip stability. And um, they got their exercises, different from each other and um, we were planning to do a retest which didn't happen because of the season and yeah well um, like problems with about uh, data no about timing so up to the last moment they do their pr they do their exercises this is Ayona in Pyeongchang um, like in the warming up right before uh, right before competition and um, 
you see they train, she trains complex movements. It's just not, not only the foot, but it's also the foot, the back, and the, the movement, landing, the arm positions, and so on. And if they all do that, and they did, and they worked on it very hard, um, you can get a season like this, which they did. So it was pretty successful what they did. So what are the take-home messages, messages for you as a coaches? Um, imbalances, both static but muscle imbalances, can cause pain in many places of the body, not only the foot and the, and, and the, the lower parts, but also if, you, if your athlete always has headache, I mean, he cannot train well with that as well. Um, they can increase the risk of overuse and accidents. If you have to train the muscle in a chain of movements, you don't have to train it isolated, but it's in a complex chain, so we come back to Peter again. Um, and the testing may be a task for the summer, but the training is a task, the task for the whole season up to the last minute. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. It's very useful information for us. If the uh, speakers would mind just coming up to the front, we can have discussion or questions from the audience and also our online viewers. Uh, Susanna has the, um, all, all the people at home watching, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to see if we can give you some answers or create a discussion, because you guys in the, in the um, audience might also have some answers for us. Uh, here, here is a question. Um, the main issue that we all saw during the last couple of seasons, especially in men's single skating, is a lot of ankle injuries, which are mostly hard to determine due to a lot of inflammation. Can we prevent it? Can it be prevented? And there's the top men's skaters uh, practice quads and lots so inevitable to have those issues but is there anything that could be done to pre prevent this? So it was about uh, ankle injuries and uh, hard to determine due to a lot of inflammation. Well, I can, I, I'll start at least. Um, I think that, you know, training the number of quads and the varieties of quads um, that we're seeing now is, is very much a moving target. I think our coaches are all learning how to do this. And so going back to, I think that you heard from all three of us, all four of us today is, um, of course, training the body to be able to train for the quads is going to be critically important, particularly preparing the body tissues. And um, as we heard, um, training in complex movement not just in isolation, and then coming back to Dr. Morin and having good equipment. So it's really a multifaceted approach. Yeah. I think that um, part of it is, um, we'll try to work with the equipment the best we can, but uh, I think all of us have mentioned that the alignment of the body, the muscle imbalance uh, is key, so your preseason assessment is very important and then making sure that your tissues are in their best form to absorb the stress as they can. So our athletes have always been stretching, but I think Peter's message and um, Sven's message about making this sure the soft tissues are pliable, the, not only the tendons, but the fascia, the different fascial planes move properly, and that you don't have muscle imbalance, you can help prevent some of those injuries. And particularly in the ankle, because we have such a boot that is like a concrete boot, uh, a lot of our skaters don't do enough off-ice uh, balance and proprioception training because they hope that the boot will protect their ankle. And they really need to work on that off-ice so they don't depend on the boot on ice. Sven? David? Yeah, the, that brings me, we had like 20 years ago, we had a study going which showed that, that the, the more stable a boot is, the less um, the less help it gives you in the end, because the proprioception gets worse. And we had comparisons between ice dancers with the softer boots and figure skaters with the harder boots, and the ice dancers had less, um, less off-ice, well, off-ice they had the same uh, impact in training, and they had less off-ice injuries. 
than the figure skaters who used the, the stiff boots. So I think it was maybe a, a wrong direction to make the boot even stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. I think it should be a little more flexible, but that comes up what you said, yeah, with the same thing. Uh, we stress coaches to make off-ice training uh, every time before to go in the ice rink. Perhaps for some children there is the problem that they arrive late uh, due to school and so sometimes it's very difficult. For top athletes there are no problems, but the problems is for the lower level because we have not so many time to spend for off, our off ice training, but it's fundamental, yeah. One thing that I would add to that is, especially with quads, is the progression of how the athletes are training the quad over the course of the season and how many they're expected to do in training. Um, and I think that that's something that you'll see change as we learn more about the quads and we have even more athletes performing it, um, is that they are probably not going to train the same volume of jumps throughout the whole season and stay healthy. Ed? Yes, sir. Wait a, wait a second, so we give you our microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> Have you considered or are you considering looking at the upper body and core strength and correlating that to what is going on in the uh, pressure, landing, etc.? Because if you look at other sports, for example, track, uh, initially there was a lot of work done with the lower limbs. Uh, they've gone into looking at core strength and uh, upper body strength and have found that uh, performance has improved and injuries have decreased. Uh, we are a total body and I think that correlating what you are doing now in, as well as uh, what goes on above the hips is going to be very important to be able to decrease the amount of lower body injuries. I can agree, totally. Well, I would agree because, I mean, you have seen, I say it's a, it's a whole body system, and I think Peter will agree as well, but he had to concentrate in his uh, thing on, on some points. I mean, I would absolutely agree, and I would say in the, in the movement screen that we've developed, um, just like the, the FMS that's available, um, there's absolutely emphasis on core stability as, as a major part. Um, and one of the things that we're doing now is looking at intervention, so not just um, screening, and we do shoulders and core as well as lower extremity mobility, um, but also we kind of use a red, yellow, green flag system and um, we started using this a couple years ago with our top athletes and we've moved quite a few of them from the reds and the yellows into the yellows and the greens even within the course of, of a year or two. So uh, now we're trying to move that even more forward but I think that uh, what's happening above the hips is, is very important as well. And not, not just pairs and dance, singles for sure. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, it's, it's very difficult to cover the whole body in a tour a presentation. So uh, we've known, I think, for quite some time that core stability is imperative in our figure skaters. Without their core stability, they, they take off for their jump, their pelvis is off, they don't land properly. So core stability has been a core for us. So that's very important. And I think we also recognize that the upper body, the posture, the imbalance of fences, and uh, certainly in the ice dancers that David spends a lot of time with, is really important for their, their general um, physical conditioning and prevention of injuries. Um, our, not only the top athletes spend um, many time in uh, a ballet, uh, ballet hall is right and uh, in such situation they work a lot about postures and core stability and so yes it's I, mean, I agree with you yeah
Anyone have any comments or questions further? No? Online? Oh, yes, Mitch? From the boot, <coughs> from the boot standpoint, we need to look at what drives the market. You're absolutely right. And, you know, the coaches, it's important to understand exactly what you're saying and what the remedies are um, because the coaches and the athlete drive the market. The boot companies are going to make what the coaches and the athletes want. And sometimes I don't think all the coaches or the athletes understand what they want. And they're, you know, the bottom line is, is you put a foot in a cast, okay, your foot's going to atrophy. The same thing happens when you put your boot on and it's like a cast, your foot's going to atrophy and now it goes through the whole kinetic chain. Um, and so we all, I, I think we almost need to, this has been going on for a long time, it's not new. Um, I think we need to start out with our younger skaters and we need to get a change that way because I don't think you're going to, we're going to do it by changing our top athletes because they're so used to what they're doing. We can a little bit, but I don't think we can make big significant changes. But I think if you start at a younger age and we get a generation that's coming up, I think we'll be able to change this. But um, it, it's, you know, we've had the boot companies in um, and we did a whole thing in exactly what you're talking about. Um, and they're gonna make what the market demands. So I think we all need to get on the same, same page because it's not changing. If anything, it's getting worse. I agree with the comments, Mitch, and it's interesting because I think that the skaters learn to, their, their body learns to skate in a cast. And putting them then into a boot that has more, maybe more medial lateral stability, but more flexibility in the dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, they can't skate very well because their proprioception and their um, engrams for their movement patterns are conditioned for a different boot. So I agree with you totally. It's finding the right path to make that happen. So I'm hoping with these uh, seminars that we can come to a place where we are on the same page and we can work together with the boot companies to make that change with the younger generations coming out. So thank you very much for your comments. I really appreciate it. There's nothing here at the moment, but, but I was kind of thinking as an informal skater and listening to you, uh, and I, I'm sure that very many kind of share it, oh, oh gosh, there's a lot to do and a lot to kind of uh, take into consideration. So what would be your kind of um, three things to look at? Kind of if, if, if you're a coach, if you're a skater, so kind of do at least this. So, so kind of a, where to start? What is the most important? I think it's all of what you say is so, so important, but kind of a, where, what you kind of a take away of, of, if I remember three things, what would it be? I'm sitting on the left side next time, so I don't have to go first. Um, yeah, you're smart. Um, so I think it's interesting to investigate all these things from a scientific perspective, but I think that probably the most important thing is having a plan to put it into action. So we can learn about this, but like what Mitch just said, we've been doing this for so long, but what, what really has changed? And so whether it's generational, whether it's what we're doing with our athletes now, and they're taking that as a nugget into their own career as a, as a figure skating coach or as a physician or a scientist, um, helping our next generation of athletes in skating or, or any sport really, but really putting it into practice. And sometimes, and what I've seen in the United States is, is maybe it takes that one breakthrough athlete that maybe worked with a key trainer or a key coach and people say, hey, look at what he's doing and he's winning. And so they're following that. So I would say, I guess it's not really three things, but having a plan to put it into action and what are you going to do um, even as step one to, to make some changes about what we're talking about. Me? You. 
So when, when yeah. When, uh, yeah. Uh, no, just. Uh, um, yeah. Please answer, answer first, and then you come. Uh, Sandra yeah. comes yeah. after. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, no, um, you asked my opinion. What can we do in freely? Yeah, freely. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, the most important thing is that the coach understand the potential of its athlete. So, if there's no uh, margin to to get the extremely difficulties you can stop before and uh, try to find to gain the scores with uh, the compositions uh, with the, the artistic uh, performance not just on the technical elements because if the the jump doesn't flow uh, well you can you 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 overload the structure, so the, the coach must read its athlete, read, must be able to read the potentiality of its athlete, and then custom the program uh, on that. Me too, I don't have three points to say, but I would say don't, don't have your athlete specialized too early on just skating. Just let him do, just especially those kids from 7 to 13 or 14, let them do other sports as well, including balls, including uh, whatever they want to do, because they, if they're a complex, if they know the movements of many sports, they have already the good, um, the good um, all, the, all the tools they need for being a good skater, and not just being too early on the ice, just on the ice, doing nothing else. That's not good for the body, I would say. And Jane? Um, I would say that the points that Sven made and uh, David and Peter are very important. And I would then go to um, directly to your current skaters and say uh, they should have a pre-season physical to make sure they don't have the imbalances and any imbalances that you see, you need to correct immediately before you put them into a really um, significant training program. And Peter's um, point that you need to customize that training program, particularly using the quads, it has to be a gradual onset. And I think if you push them too quickly, they're going to get injured. So my key would be do your assessment and find out what the, what the problem areas are. Plan a exercise program to correct those and make sure they're not only correcting the imbalances, but they're maintaining their nutrition and they're doing their um, soft tissue management so they make their tissues most flexible and pliable to maintain the training program they're about to progress into. Great. I think that's a uh, kind of list to start to, to work on. <laughs> it's easier than taking the whole science, so starting one step at a time. Sandra. Well, uh... In Pyeongchang, I asked uh, Sven one question in, uh, about ice dancers, you know, so I said to him, so who is the best one? Because I don't understand ice dancing. So he said also to me, well, I don't understand the ice dancing nowadays with the, two, with the new judging system. So it's what we do, us. But I think we should also very close cooperate with the technical committees. As I remember uh, uh, reading somewhere, Katerina with technical components would be 27, and we have Trusova with 90 at the Junior Worlds. Uh, somebody did the comparison from uh, then Hamilton, she had a long time ago, like nine, 19 technical components. I, th I read it somewhere, I don't know. I, I, just bumped into this article. So it was like, well, where are we going, really? So I think us as a medical commission, thank you also, you as a scientist and the people that work with the athletes, and you as a development commission, I think we should have people from also technical committees coming to our meetings and uh, to stop somehow this development in, in another way because uh, I was working in a 
in Zagreb as a chief medical officer and in the last seasons I never see so many injuries during the competitions as I did this year. I had uh, apophysitis from one athlete that because he was training like a quad. I had a, a fracture of a finger of an ice dancer. And I was like, wow, what are, where are we going? So that's your question usually. Where are we going? What do us as a medical commission can do? But I think the technical committee should stop also this development, putting the quads on putting, as Jane said, well-developed program was it when you have waiting two minutes and then going all the triples and quads? Is it well balanced program? So I think there's really a lot to do and really a lot to say. And we don't have much time here to discuss about it. But yes, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Jane, for starting this. Well, we did some researches a long time ago and now Fabio came and said, uh, are we going to forbid the quads in uh, pairs? Well, we do need scientific research to also tell them where and what to stop. Gymnasts, they changed so much in their routine and in some reg regulations. So I think also they decreased the uh, injuries in gymnastics and we are somehow on the same level, right? Lots of questions, sorry. <laughs> I think the, we do have lots of questions, but hopefully we're starting to get a few of the answers. And uh, the key is, is that our skaters want to perform. They want to do their best. They want to improve. And it's our job to keep them healthy and let them progress and perform to the best of their potential and their desires. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and online. Thank you very much for being with us today online. And I'd like to thank our other speakers for helping me out with this seminar. Thank you very much, Sven, David, and Peter. And um, thank you all very much for coming. I very much appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you.